good afternoon to everyone there. Um, I'm uh, my understanding is I've got about 10 minutes here. So um, I'm going to this is a, a large, a very large project um, that that could consume far more than 10 minutes. So I'm just going to touch on some some key points here um, of the research and then very, very happy to um, discuss it further uh, later with anyone interested. Um, so this is a, a project that sort of takes a step back um, and says and sort of asks, are there particular barriers to innovation, innovations in peacekeeping in studying political violence more generally and ask the question, um, in what ways, how do we understand patterns of violent unrest around the world? Um, and one way that we do that is through the compilation of news reports. And so that's really what this project seeks to understand, um, the effects of particular news reporting patterns on how we then understand uh, global unrest, whether that's political violence, um, protest, riot activity, so on and so forth. This is a, a large project with a number of co-authors, um, uh, including Michael Weintraub, who may be in the audience or at least is there with you all um, in Helsinki for the, the conference. Um, so, right, the starting point of, of the, the research is the same reason we're all assembled, right, which is we, we care and we're concerned about political violence, understanding its causes and its consequences and how to mitigate it. Um, and one way we've done that, as I mentioned, is uh, to take news reports, we sort of the broader academic and, and, and sort of um, NGO community, to take incidents of violence reported in the new, often in the news, not exclusively, but often in the news, um, and then to compile those into very, very large data sets um, that we can then use as quantitative scholars to then try to understand patterns of, again, of, of political violence, whether on a, 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 whether comparing across countries or with, within countries. And there are a variety of, of efforts to do this. Um, the the um, GED data set, the GeoReference Event data set, um, out of the Uppsala Conflict Data uh, Program, PRIO, um, has, has one such data set, the Global Terrorism data set out of the University of Maryland, um, ACLID, the Armed Conflict Location Event Data Project, um, the Social Conflict Analysis data set, which previously was known as the Social Conflict in Africa data set, um, IQs, the Integrated cr uh, Crisis Early Warning System, um, just to name a few. And again, um, th these these uh, these don't rely entirely on news reports, um, but 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 the the uh, preponderance of the material, at least for many country cases, does come news from news reports. Um, and these 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 type of data, these news report based data, are used to study a, a wide variety of political violence. Um, so I don't need to rattle these off, but everything from terrorist activity to how we understand electoral violence um, to violence against peacekeeping forces, often it's, it's news media that, that is sort of the source, the, 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 the primary source of our understanding of political violence. Who uses these data? Many of us in academia use these data uh, and have used them to publish a number of leading economic, political science and other journals, but it doesn't stop there, right? Government organiz a variety of US and other government organizations use these and not only use them, but indeed fund them. Um, so a lot of funding for some of these organizations comes from different government partners um, and a number of think tanks, NGOs, international organizations use them as well, right? So there are implications beyond um, the academic inferences that we derive from these data, but I think implications for government and other users of them as well as, as as members of the policy community attempt to craft and, and programming community attempt to craft solutions again to, to political violence. And so it raises this really fundamental question, which is do media reports in of conflict or other forms of unrest when aggregated, do they provide a generally accurate picture of political violence? What do we mean by accuracy? What we could mean the place is the place generally accurately depicted the timing, the motivation, the target, the weaponry employed, the group implicated or affected the outcome, right? We can think about this across a wide variety of dimensions. Um, and I'm gonna just start with this quote from a current uh, staff writer at the New York Times who interviewed for the project, right? Who, who, who basically said to us like, there's a lot of violence that happens and it, it can't all be written about nor, nor should it all be written about. I'm paraphrasing. Um, we are not just a chronicle of all violent events that take place over the course of a day, right? So the starting point here is that if you talk to the news media, I think the sort of general response is like, no, we, we, we're not a chronicle of all events. And so if you, if you aggregate them, then that might raise some questions about like whether certain types of events are being systematically missed. So what are the findings of our project in brief? 
Um, we're going to estimate that the media based data sets, uh, at least those that we study in this project significantly and uh, systematically under report particular type types of violent events. Um, and that when we use them in what we call a reverse replication exercise, basically asking whether a number of existing academic studies um, can be can be recovered in terms of the results they find using media based data we find that in the majority of cases they cannot. Um, Clearly, there are, I think, a number of reasons to be concerned about cross-country comparisons using media-based data. Um, this quote from one of our interviewees, I think, really kind of really kind of brings this home, right? So this is an individual working for one of the, the leading wire services um, in the world, talking about working on Yemen for 18 months and during that period, never being able to get a visa to, to even go to the country in the first place. And this was during the Saudi intervention when a lot of, import, when a lot of, of violence was taking place. Um, and con he, he then contrasts that with Ukraine, right, where he says there are probably 3,000 foreign journalists there now. I could go tomorrow, get on a flight to Poland, cross over the border relatively easily. So you can you, right away, we can see that just like the restrictive nature of, of government policies leads to situations in which some countries are going to get a lot of reporting, some are not. Um, but what about within country comparisons, right? If we say, well, let's let's hold the country fixed. Let's only look at violence in, 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 in Eritrea. Let's only look at violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Let's only look at violence in Afghanistan. Do these, do, do these data sets do better? Um, and here, another, uh, this one, former New York Times reporter, I think gave a quote that really kind of illustrates the concern here. Um, uh, who, and he basically said to us, if one Iraqi were, he, he worked in, uh, in Baghdad um, and he talked about how if one Iraqi were killed, it wasn't a story. If five were killed, it wasn't a story. 10 were killed, maybe it was a story. If 20 or more were killed, that was a story. In contrast, if a, if a, if a single American soldier was killed, that was a story, right? So right away, we see what my co-authors and I describe as an editorial bias, the, the tendency for news media to simply decide that certain stories are worth more coverage than others, right? And so if, if certain stories are being systematically omitted, then, then that would be the source of bias, right? So that's what we call in the, the class of editorial biases. We, we come up with a, a number of these, um, which I'm happy to go through later. The other way we think about this is a capability bias. Uh, simply not all violence can be covered because journalists face a number of restrictions on their reporting. So one interview, for example, talked about certain places in Colombia where their team sim simply can't go because it was too unsafe to cover violence and other issues. Um, to go back to the previous interviewee who talked about uh, Mosul in particular really being unreachable during the Iraq war. And so you could imagine a, li a, a limit or a lack of coverage on, on that part of the country for lack of, of safety, so on and so forth. And so how are we going to carry out our study? What we're going to do is we're going to take the media-based data sets and we're going to compare them to different administrative data collected by different government forces in different campaigns. We're going to use data supplied by the U.S. Defense Department <clears throat> uh, for the year, basically 2016 and early 2017, on its airstrikes against ISIS targets in Iraq and Syria. We're going to look at violence recorded by U.S. and partner forces in Afghanistan during the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, similar for Iraq. And then we're going to use data from the Philippines, released by the Philippines military and police forces, roughly 25,000 observations of data. And then finally, we're going to use some data uh, released on protest and riot activity from the South African Police Service. And basically, the, the reason we're going to do this is we're going to, we, we first note that there are many ongoing collection efforts that really, uh, that, that, that are incredibly detailed. Um, and so here we can see, for example, just from the SIGAX data from Afghanistan, how detailed the data are from the Helmand region, a very violent area of Afghanistan during the war, so violent and so detailed that you can actually see the the outline of the road network here, even though there's no road map superimposed in the background here. So these are incredibly detailed data, but why trust them, right? Why trust the records? Um, and, 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 and the trust comes from a couple of sources. First, um, in the case of the data from Iraq, Afghanistan, the Philippines, um, is, and then Iraq and Syria for, for the campaign against ISIS, these were um, detail, these were data constructed uh, by military following very specific military protocol using advanced technologies that allowed them to basically get a high degree of spatial and temporal accuracy. Second, right there, collected with standard operating procedures that raised the confidence that they were reported sort of regardless of when and where they took place. Um, a big part of this is that they were released, <clears throat> that the, these data were generated uh, for internal consumption. So the, the data that was released by the U.S. Defense Department, for example, was previously classified data meaning that it was, it, was, it was constructed in such a way that it was, it was purposely not released to the public. 
Um, and then it was only through the declassification process that we were able to get these data. Um, and then one last point I'll make is with respect to the campaign against ISIS, um, each of these bombings, right, that we see in the data, um, you know, cost anywhere between tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so a sort of final assumption that we make, at least in comparing that data, is um, that these are these are incredibly expensive attacks that I think raise the raise the the, the likelihood that uh, the, the uh, decrease the likelihood that things were being either concealed or fabricated, right? Because you'd have to kind of figure out a way to do so internally for internal documents in a way where you're kind of omitting these attacks that are costing the government hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. Uh, Andrew, can um, you hear me okay? Uh, can yes. I ask you to wrap up? Yep, totally. So Thank what you. we're gonna do is we're gonna, as I mentioned, um, carry out a series of reverse replication exercises where basically we're gonna take studies published in the American Political uh, Journal of Political Science, American Political Science Review, and other, other studies. And we're basically going to um, we're basically going to then look at the extent to which they we're able to recover the results using these media-based data sets. Um, we find in roughly 70% of cases you can't. Um, and so, and then we're gonna look for a series of specific sources of, of, of missingness. Um, I can get into those in the question and answer session if you're interested, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there um, for the sake of time and, and for the next presentation. Thank you so much.